My name is Gus Van Harten and I'm a law professor at Osgoode Hall Law School of York University in Toronto, Canada. And in this presentation I'll be showing you some recent research on the question of who has benefited financially from foreign investor protections like the ones proposed now for expansion in the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the Canada-Europe CETA, and the Europe-United States TTIP. The foreign investor protections I'm speaking about are also sometimes called Investor State Dispute Settlement or ISDS. And in this slide, which uh, is very text heavy, I apologize for that, but the slide really is just making the point that foreign investors get some very significant legal advantages in ISDS, which would not otherwise be available in international or domestic law. I'm not going to go through the details on the slide, but uh, I simply want to make the point that this system provides legal benefits and privileges that are not available to domestic investors or others, um, you know, typical citizens who don't qualify as foreign investors. And we do a, a re I do, and sometimes with colleagues, uh, we do uh, research on ISDS and how the lawyers who sit as arbitrators in ISDS, how they've used their their power under trade agreements and investment treaties. And uh, the present presentation is dealing with the last uh, question on this slide, which is really the follow the money question. Who has benefited financially from the existence of ISDS so far under trade agreements and investment treaties that allow for ISDS. So I'm talking about what has happened in the past. I'm not making predictions about the future. The slide presentation here is dealing with what we would call descriptive statistics. Um, very simply, this slide is showing increasing use by foreign investors of the ISDS mechanism under trade agreements and investment treaties. The, their use of this system really began in the late 1990s and has been increasing steadily since that time. So it's a, it's a fairly recent um, mechanism and uh, you can see that in this slide. As well, the arbitrators who decide foreign investor claims against countries have been awarding compensation to be paid by countries to foreign investors in some cases. And this is just showing the total compensation that has been ordered in known and publicly available cases to spring of 2015. And you can see that um, there's been a, a especially recently, uh, significant growth in the total amount of compensation awarded to foreign investors in all cases that we know of. <clears throat> this slide and the graphics aren't going to be entirely um, feasible, so they're all appearing here at the same time. This slide, uh, there would be very nice graphics if I could just present them, you know, the bubbles that came up one at a time. But anyway, this slide is showing how the total compensation ordered by the arbitration tribunals in ISDS cases to the cutoff date we used uh, has been distributed according to the size of the claimant uh, or the wealth of the claimant. So when the foreign investor, the claimant, was a corporation, we tracked its ultimate ownership and identified whether the claim was attributable to an extra large company with annual revenues of over $10 billion, a very rich individual, which we define simply as uh, an individual with net wealth of over $100 million, a large company with annual revenue of between one and ten billion dollars uh, and then various other categories including uh, medium companies which we defined as companies with annual revenue of between 100 million and one billion dollars and smaller companies with under 100 million in 
annual revenue and other individuals was anyone with net wealth below $100 million. And the main point here, obviously, is that uh, the significant majority of the compensation ordered has gone to companies with over $10 billion in annual revenue and uh, also uh, very wealthy individuals and large companies have obtained significant compensation amounts in total. And this uh, image is just showing the same um, finding. And it's uh, again just demonstrating that the great bulk of the total compensation ordered has gone to large or extra large companies or to very wealthy individuals. In this uh, graph, what I've done is incorporate the legal and arbitration fees that have been paid in cases. So the total amounts awarded uh, in the aggregate to foreign investors who brought claims, uh, it's been adjusted according to the average legal and arbitration cost of the claim. And we took the average to be $8 million for both sides based on research by some OECD researchers on that question. And we just simply accounted for that average across all the cases that were in the data set. And what emerged was that extra large companies were still the biggest beneficiaries overall, but that, um, you know, an approximate second biggest beneficiary, um, approximately $1.7 billion net gain, went to the ISDS legal industry, which would include lawyers and arbitrators and other experts who are getting paid fees in the system. And then you can see how other uh, groups have fared. And we see the big loser, obviously, is responding countries because they can't bring any claims or get an order of compensation for a violation of treaty by a, a foreign investor. Um, so they're, they're payers in the system. And this uh, t approximately $10 billion in net loss would um, account for the amounts they've been ordered to pay in awards and for the legal and arbitration fees that they have paid in the cases based on the, um, the estimate of the average cost of cases that I mentioned just a minute ago. Next point I'd like to make is that the treaties that led to this uh, explosion of foreign investor claims since the late 1990s, most of the treaties uh, that um, those claims were authorized under were signed in the early 1990s, from 1990 to 1995. So, one thing to observe about that is that uh, governments were not necessarily aware of how these treaties and the ISDS was going to be used to bring all of these foreign investor claims when they were considering those uh, treaties uh, that have generated most of the claims so far uh, because the treaties were signed um, before the, the explosion of claims. And Related to that point, today we have some significant new treaties proposed, and I say they're significant because they would greatly expand the scope of ISDS as measured by, in this slide, using the U.S. economy as a proxy. I've simply compared the U.S. Inward Foreign Direct Investment, or FDI, stock to its coverage by an existing U.S. treaty that allows for ISDS. And what we see is where we are now is covered by the black in this um, image. And the black uh, reflects a trade agreement or investment treaty with ISDS and the share of U.S. inward FDI stock that's covered by an existing trade or investment agreement of the U.S.
with that, that provides for ICS. If the Trans-Pacific Partnership were concluded, uh, then it would roughly double the scope of the authority or power of the lawyers and arbitrators uh, who uh, make decisions in ISDS and the um, coverage of ISDS roughly of um, the foreign owned economy in the United States. And the really big one is the yellow, which is the US EU TTIP would obviously expand dramatically the role of ISDS as a decision making process for the uh, the US uh, economy. So I'm just making the point here that a few new agreements can radically expand the role of ISDS and really if they're all concluded ISDS becomes uh, uh, in effect uh, a global uh, institution. There are a couple of more slides in the deck that um, um, are comparable to the ones I've already shown but with slightly different data. I'm not going to spend any time on those. Um, and this last slide is just providing some sources. So thanks very much and I hope you find that a little bit interesting. Have a good day.